Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the ultimate set of Eric Satie orchestral music. In fact, there's even more orchestral music than Satie actually wrote. It is this one on the Vanguard label with the Utah Symphony, believe it or not, conducted by Maurice Abravanel, who was around in the 1920s when this stuff was written and who is absolutely the ideal Satie interpreter. He's perfect for this music for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which was his training in Berlin of the 1920s in that whole cabaret, crazy era of Weimar surrealist, phantasmagorical kookiness. And he was a fabulous conductor of kookiness. And then, of course, the Nazis came to power and he wound up in Paris where he picked up all of that stuff as well. I mean, he was just ideal. And when he came to the United States and grabbed the Utah Symphony, where he stayed for about a zillion years, he turned it into an ideal orchestra for this kind of music. And I'm going to play you some samples, but first let me tell you what's on here. This is just, this is so great. And it's fabulously well recorded. And it's inexpensive. I mean, what could be better? I mean, there's not even, it's not even that. There's more. There's more. The, the, the liner notes, here they are. There they are. Some fairly substantial ones are actually written by Darius Mio, who discovered and orchestrated Satie's Jack in the Box. I mean, Darius Mio writes the notes to the Satie set. Fabulous. And then there's another essay on the actual music besides Mio. And then there's a very funny couple of paragraphs by Satie himself describing himself. And I'm going to read you a little bit of it because it's just kind of fun to listen to. He writes, Everyone will tell you that I am not a musician. That is true. Even the beginning, even the beginning of my career, oh, from the beginning of my career, I, I classed myself among the photo, what is this word here? It's like photometographers, photometographers. Yes, my, my work is nothing but pure photo, phonometry. Oh, phonometographers. Yes, my work is nothing but pure phonometry. Take, for example, the Fille des Etoiles or the Sarabande, and it will be seen at once that in the creation of these works, musical ideas played no part at all. They are pure science. You get the picture. This is just fantastic. So let's talk about what's on the actual two discs and we will listen to some samples. Essentially, you have one disc plus a teeny bit of original orchestral music by Satie, and the rest consists of orchestrations by his friends and buddies of some of his other works, including some of his most famous. So to start with, there is Parade, the most wonderful surrealist ballet that ever existed. And just to show you how fabulous, fabulous, a Bravenel is. I'm going to play you the second number here, which is the the prestidigitaire chinoise, the Chinese magician. And listen carefully to the tam tam part, because no one has ever done it so well. The orchestral sonority that a Bravenel gets in this piece is absolutely amazing. Because, and I have to tell you why, Satie wrote very little orchestral music, as you may have guessed. It was not his thing. And his orchestration can sound rather gray and uninteresting. He was scientifique. He was more interested in measuring the sound than in listening to it, perhaps. I don't know if that's the thing, but the bottom line is that his orchestration has a kind of innocent crudity, you know, with everything standing out and nothing blending and no effort at, you know, sensuality of sound or anything like that. That wasn't his deal. He wanted, he wanted everything to be bright and postcard-like and, and totally clear and, and every instrument to have its own personal integrity. And if it, they don't really always come together to make a harmonious whole, well, you know, that's the way it went. And here is a case in point where every sound that Abravanel makes is 
absolutely perfect. And listen to the Tam Tam. I have to make a point about Tam Tamosity. If if Seti was a, a a phonographer or a phonograta, whatever the heck he was, phonometrographer or whatever, then I'm a Tam 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 Tamographer. And I will explain to you on the other side of this amazingly fabulous example. Have a listen. Did you hear just the amazing sound of that orchestra, how the trombones and the strings and everything seemed to be almost traced with a highlighter, you know, just a vividness and color to it. Partly it's the engineering, which is marvelous. But did you hear that soft tam tam in the back? That tells us something because I've heard about a hundred million versions of Parade and this one is hands down the best. It really is. But you have to understand that this is our period instrument lecture, by the way. Me, of all people, talking about period instruments. The tam-tams in Paris and in most of the world at this point in the 1920s were not terribly large. How do we know this? We know this because, for example, if you look at the instrumentarium in Varese's music from the 19 teens and twenties. He actually specifies the size of tam-tams and he calls a very large tam-tam a tam-tam that's between 30 and 36 inches. Now this sucker behind me is 32 and it's small by today's standards. Nowadays, because China has opened up and percussion instruments have become such the rage in 20th century music, large and a wide variety of instruments are very, very easy to come by. But in the world of music in the in the late 1900s, I mean, late 1800s and early 1900s, good percussion instruments were very hard to come by. I mean, you can hear this on recordings. Most German orchestras had a horrible, horrible sounding percussion, really into like the 1970s. Really, really astonishingly bad sounding instruments, just in terms of their timbral quality. And so, and so what we would consider a small or medium sized tam tam, 30 to 36 inches, would be large, was considered very large in, in, in the day. And so the average tam tam was rather small. It was about 24, 26 inches, something like, for example, uh, uh, this one, which I had custom made. This is, this is a beautiful sounding instrument, and it is perfect for Satie's Parade. In fact, it will make a sound very similar to the one that you heard on the Abravanel recording. And let me show you. 
And, and this is exactly the kind of thing that most people simply don't pay attention to these days when they perform conductors. They don't care. They just like, they just, you know, wheel out their giant, giant, you know, enormous Tam Tam object and they try and play the part and it doesn't work because it's a magician. It's a Chinese magician. And so much of the atmosphere of the piece depends on the color of the percussion instruments. So listen to this, you'll get a sound very similar to what you heard from a Bravanel. Ready? See? It's, it's a light sound, but very spread out and it speaks immediately. So you're doing this. Sitting down like this, it's hard for me to do it evenly, but you get the point. This is the sound. <laughs> Sitting here. This is the sound, damn it, that Satie must have had in mind when he wrote the piece because you just know it because it just sounds right. You can tell immediately. It just sounds fabulous, fabulous. And you're not going to get that sound with these ginormous things that they use today. And so, you know, one of the things that I always listen for, and it doesn't have to just do with tam-tams. I mean, this is a convenient example. It's also true of English horns and oboes and the trombones doing yum ba ba you know, with a real rasp to their tone. You have to get the right sonority, and you have to tell your players to produce the right sonority. And Abravanel was able to do that. He did it extremely well in this French music, particularly. It was a real, ex a real specialty of his. So this parade is the best parade ever in the history of the universe. And then you get, let's see, the other two ballets that Satie wrote, The Adventures of Mercury, Les Adventures de Mercure, and you get a relâche which is his last ballet, his last major work of any kind, which is a ballet about absolutely nothing. It's another surrealist, nobody knows what's going on kind of piece. And then you get the 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 Cinq Grimaces pour un songe du nuit d'été. He actually wrote some incidental music for A Midsummer Night's Dream, which never was used, but the music exists. It's tiny, one, two, three, four, five little bits ranging in length from 24 seconds to 56 seconds. I mean, Satie tends to be brief, right? Little tiny pieces. And then you also have La Belle Excentrique, La Grande Retournelle. And I'm going to play you the whole thing, too. Now, that is cabaret music. It is written for a cabaret dancer. It is Satie's view of what you heard in a French nightclub, except not really, except it's really Satie. And again, that wonderful sounding orchestration, the slightly brash trumpets, the, the grunty, groany bassoons. Oh, God, it's fabulous. So here is, and the whole thing's only a minute and 39 seconds long. It's a miniature masterpiece on top of everything else. So here is La Belle Excentrique. <laughs> Thank you. 
So you're getting the picture, right? So now, after disc, we get to disc two, it begins with, with in riding clothes, on la beat de cheval. And then we have orchestrations. Orchestrations by different people. You have Jack of the Box by Mio. You have Le Fille des Etoiles. I think that's Roger Desormiers or someone like that did that. Then you have the De Prelude Postume et une Gnossienne. That's Poulenc for those three pieces. And then you have the Morceau en Forme de Poire. That was another one of the Lacy's people. I mean, it tells you who did it here. Um, let me see. Who, ah, who cares? Someone else. And um, one, of, one of those guys. And first, and I mean, most importantly, Les Deux Gymnopédies, numéro un et trois, et trois. And of course, the most famous is Gymnopédie trois, orchestrated by Debussy, incredibly sensuously. And here is another wonderful example of a Bravanel at work, because the orchestration with the the very soft suspended cymbal and the harp and the high, high violins, the spread out sonorities. Yes, it's DBC. It's very DBC ish, but it's also satire ish because Abravanel conducts it with such clarity, such pinpoint inflection and gentle accent at every turn. I'm going to play the first half of it because it's long. It's like three minutes. But I'm going to play the first half of it. Just listen to how every single instrument has its place in the whole. And it's, it's so vivid. It's so marvelous. I, I just I can't praise these performances enough. So here is Gymnopédie numéro 3. C'est l'extase. It's exquisite, is it not? Amazing, just amazing. These performances are uniformly amazing. The whole package really is a historical and artistic monument, in a sense. It really is. I mean, it is, it's from a conductor who knew the style, knew what was what was going on in the period, knew how to play the music, had a fabulous relationship with all of these people who were involved in its creation, number one. Number two, you get the notes by Mio, who was involved in this, and of course, who was involved with Abravanel heavily, because Abravanel conducted quite a bit of his music for Vanguard. And I am asking music concepts, Todd, please do an Abravanel box. Do an Abravanel box. And I don't mean just the usual. I know we've got his Sibelius, we have his Tchaikovsky, we have his Mahler. It's not what we need. What we need is all of his French music, all of the unusual repertoire, all of the stuff that made him special at a time when you could not get this music anywhere else. That's what we need. So please, we're all waiting. In the meantime, we have this superb, superb two-disc set of music by Satie, the, all the orchestral music he wrote and didn't write, which is a very Satie-esque concept, I think, in the best performances you'll ever hear in your life. Just, just the best, absolutely the best, nothing but the best. 
And so let us end with a celebratory whack on the correct Tam Tam. See, you hear that? That's what a real Tam Tam in Satie's day probably sounded like. High, splashy, somewhat thin, and absolutely right for what the composer was trying to do. Because despite the fact that Satie said he was not a musician, even if he was just a phonometer or whatever he called himself, he had incredibly acute hearing and a very keen, keen sense of instrumental timbre for what he did, even in his orchestral music. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.